Good evening, church. We're so glad you're here tonight to worship the Lord with us. Let's sing this out. Breathe on me, breath of God. Breathe on me. May this be our prayer tonight. Amen. Let's continue to worship this evening. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. In the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone Who took on flesh Fullness of God in helpless babe This gift of love And righteousness Scorned by the one he came to save. Still on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground, there in 
with the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse and lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever put me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand the Hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. If you believe that, church, say amen. Thank you for coming this evening. Reach across the aisle and welcome one another.
cross, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. If you're not going to turn back tonight, say amen, church. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us tonight. You may be seated. Father God, uh, we have come here today to hear from you, to worship you, Lord, and invite you into our presence. And Lord, you have been invited, and you tell us in your word you inhabit the praise of your people. We've lifted up our hearts and minds to praise you. And now, Lord, may we allow your truth to come alive in our hearts for it to become not just a thought, but our way of life. Bless us as we apply it to it our individual lives. We pray in Jesus' holy name. If you pray with me, church, say amen. amen. Um, we have been doing this series now two weeks on financial freedom. Now, now, why are we talking about financial freedom? Because the Bible says a couple things. First of all, it says that there's a harvest that is ripe and ready to be harvested. But if what we're focused on and concerned about all the time is paying our bills and worrying about being broke, it's kind of hard to harvest souls when you're worried about making next month's bills. Can I get an amen? amen. And so God, therefore, so that we can put our mind on the proper things, he speaks a lot about finances. In fact, in the New Testament, for every one time you see God talking about his love, Four times he talks about money. Four to one he talks about money versus his love. And you're like, well, God talked about money a lot. Exactly, because it, it is a currency, not just the bills, but it is, a, it is a system where it reveals our philosophy, value system, and mindset for life. The way we handle our finances a real, it really reveals our whole belief system about what this life is about. Now, why does God give us wealth in the first place? Well, the reason that he gives us wealth, according to Scripture, first reason, this is not in your notes, you can write this down, the first reason God gives us wealth is to meet your needs. Isn't that nice of God? Remember what he says in the Lord's Prayer. He says, give us this day our daily bread. Okay, we're praying about that, and elsewhere in the gospel, Jesus says, the Father knows what you need before you even ask. God gives us resources, wealth, to meet our needs, first and foremost. Secondly, he gives us wealth to build his kingdom. He doesn't do it invisibly, he does it through his children. What a privilege it is that the King of kings and Lord of lords has invited us, his children, to be involved in building his kingdom, and he has given us, entrusted to us, the resources to do that. The third thing he's given us wealth for, ready, is for our enjoyment. You say, that's in the Bible? Absolutely, it's in the Bible. Ecclesiastes says it's a blessing of God for a man to enjoy the rewards of his labor. God wants us to enjoy the rewards of our work. Some people don't understand how to enjoy their wealth. And let me tell you, here's how the Bible says to enjoy it the most. Most people in America, they sit there, well, if I could receive more, I would be happier. Right? Isn't that the mindset of most people in America? Right. What does the Bible say? The Bible says you will enjoy life more because blessed is he that gives than he that receives. If we do it right, do it according to God's word, we will have plenty to give to others, which makes life really exciting. When you can help somebody with a need in their life, man, it just, just makes your heart pump. Okay? So those are the reasons God gives us wealth. He gives us wealth to meet our needs, to build his kingdom and for our enjoyment. And what does that mean? Well, does that mean that we can't do a vacation and get the big ears? Yes, you could do that. Right. It's, it's not wrong. But if you're taking the vacation with big ears and you're worried about next month's mortgage payment, you have not been following the good book. Bad, okay. So let's look at the resources God has given us. In tonight's message, 
that I've entitled saying yes or no. Saying yes or no. I know you can do this. Everybody say yes. yes. I knew you could do it. Where's my sweater? Okay, can we do this other word? No. no. I knew you could. Okay. We can say yes or no. Okay. You just proved it right there. Here's what the Bible says in Matthew 5, 37. But let your word yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. He's telling us here to be decisive in life. And when we say yes, we should mean it. When we say no, we should mean it. And we should remove maybes from our life. Because maybe is not conclusive and it's not a mindset. It typically maybe is a procrastination problem. That's another message. But tonight we're going to look at saying yes and saying no. The Bible tells us that preparing for life cycles, preparing for life cycles, takes the stress out of living. The number one disease in America is stress. There are more people in the hospitals because of stress-related disease than anything else. It's a higher percentage of everything in the hospital. Stress-related disease. The number one reason for divorce in the first 10 years of marriage, 70% money issues. The stress of money issues. 70% of divorces that happen within the first 10 years state money problems as the reason. Why? It's stressful. It's stressful. And so God says, prepare for life cycles, and then it takes the stress out of living. Now, go to Genesis 41, and we use Joseph, who has got to be one of my favorite characters in the Bible. And Joseph, remember, his life didn't go too well, did it? But he kept being faithful to God, and God kept, what, taking care of him, meeting his needs, and then he elevated him from prison to second in command of Egypt in one day, one afternoon. But as we talked about last week, his character had outgrown his position, and God matched him with a position that leveled up with his character. He was faithful in Potiphar's house. He was faithful in the prison, even though he wasn't really getting rewarded for it. And because he kept his character, God then all of a sudden overnight rewarded him with this unbelievable elevation, and he interpreted Pharaoh's dream. And what was the dream? The dream was about cycles, about cycles. He told him there's going to be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine as he interpreted the dream that God had given Pharaoh. Let's look at it, verse 25 of Genesis 41. And Joseph said to Pharaoh, as he's interpreting the dream, Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven ripe heads are seven years. The dreams mean the same thing. The seven thin, ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven worthless, scorched heads of grain, they are seven years of famine. It is just as I told Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. And after them, seven years of famine will take place. And all the abundance in the land of Egypt will be forgotten. The famine will devastate the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because of the famine that follows it, for the famine will be very severe. And since the dream was given twice to Pharaoh, it means that the matter has been determined by God and he will carry it out very soon. So now, let, and he counsels him. He says, let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt and let Pharaoh do this. Ready? Here's the important part. Let him appoint overseers over the land and take a fifth, 20%, a fifth of the harvest of the land of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. Let them gather all the excess food during these good years that are coming. And under Pharaoh's authority, store the grain, set it aside, store the grain in the cities so that they may preserve it as food. 
And the food will be a reserve for the land during the seven years of famine that will take place in the land of Egypt. Then the country will not be wiped out by the famine. And the proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. What was the simple God-ordained logic here? Spoken through Joseph, who's never owned anything. Okay? Never owned anything. He has been a slave his whole adult life. And yet he heard from God. He said, you're going to have seven years of plenty, followed by a cycle of seven years of famine. So what should you do? Knowing there's going to be years where it's not going to be good, set 20% aside during the good years. Set it aside. Store it for when you know the famine's coming. Store it for you know that day is coming where you are not going to want to go to work. You know that day's coming where the doctor is going to say, you shouldn't go to work. You know that day's coming. We all know it. So what did he say? Set it aside. Prepare for it and take the stress out of what's coming. Take the stress out of what's coming. No. The first thing we need to do in order to prepare for what we know, there's going to be lean times in everybody's life. We, I don't know why, but we buy into this thing that life is always going to be the same. I'm always going to be this healthy. I'm always going to make this much money. There's always going to be the, these kind of jobs. And yet we look at history and we know it's not true. It, things run in cycles. Sometimes there's boom times and sometimes there's bust times. We just lived in this area through what? A bust cycle. Everybody was underwater in their houses, Right? The car industry overnight almost folded right. were it not for the government propping it up with your tax money. Right. It was almost over. Almost over. That was what? A bus cycle. Well, we haven't come roaring back. No, not like other parts in the country. Well, we are in this area, our houses have come up back close to what they were 10 years ago. In other parts of the country, they have quadrupled in the last five years. And in their cert there's certain markets where there's a real estate bubble about to pop. Yeah. About to pop. In 2013, the average house price, sold price of a home in the state of California was $1.3 million dollars. That was the average price of a home sold in that state. You know what that is? That's a bubble. You say, man, are the wages that good out there? No, they're not. They're about 20,000 more per capita than Michigan. But that doesn't justify an average house price of $1.2, $1.3 million. <laughs> That's crazy town. It's crazy town. What does that mean? Only the very wealthy can afford a home. That's what that means. So what does it do to the young people? What does it do to the young workers? It shoes them out of the state. It shoes them out of the state. Because why? They're like, why well, live here? I can't ever own a home. Yeah. You're like, wow. Well, then why do they get so much? It's becoming a state where you have the haves, and they have a lot, and they have nots, and they have very little. And that scenario is going to play out in all of America if we don't start following the Bible. Okay, so there's boom cycles and there's bust cycles. Can I, say any, can I get an amen to that? Okay, we've all lived long enough to see that there's good times and there's also bad times. If you were alive during the 90s, man, it was sweet, wasn't it? Why? Because Ronald Reagan's what he, the principles he put, to, put together in the 80s, we saw the consequences of in the 90s. It was great to be a worker in the 90s. It was great to be an investor in the 90s. It was just great to be an American in the 90s. It was a big boom cycle. Okay? And then the 2000s, it was a bust cycle. There was a dot-com bubble. There was this bubble and that bubble. And it was a 
down cycle. So life runs in cycles. All, it doesn't matter where you live. And so it's a wrong mindset to think things are always going to be the same or how about this one? Things are always going to get better. That's not true. So what should we do? Knowing this is true, knowing that even Joseph told Pharaoh about it. Point number one, we should say no to spending and yes to saving. Did you know we live in a country of spendaholics? We live in a country where spending is the, it is, it's the national sport. It is. In order to enjoy something, we have to spend something. And, and the Bible says, though, that we should say no to spending and yes to saving. Where does it say? It says in Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 8. It says, go to the ant, you slacker. It was a young guy that wrote this version. Go to the ant, you slacker. If you have an old version, it says sluggard. Otherwise, uh, observe its ways and become wise. Look at the ant and learn from him. Now, the ant doesn't have a very big brain, does he? Not only that, he is without a leader, administrator, or a ruler, yet it prepares its provisions in the summer, it gathers its food during the harvest, and he gets ready for the winter, doesn't he? Because why? The ant knows one thing, winter's coming. And so I'm going to get ready when? In the summer. And man, they are busy all the time. Every time you look down, it's like, there they go. I mean, they are working. Constantly moving in the summer. When do you see an ant in the summer going? You see them like this. They're always looking for what? Food to take down low because they know winter's coming. And they do it, no overseer, no leaders telling them that, they know it. And so scripture, Solomon says, look at the ant. And what, is it, what do we learn? First of all, we learn to prepare for difficulty before it happens, because if you try to handle it while it happens, it's too late. Right. It's too late. So what do you hear about America? We hear in America that the average person begins preparing for retirement, ready, at age 50. Say, can you prepare for it? Yes, but your preparation is going to be pretty thin. When should you prepare for retirement? Your first paycheck. Your very first paycheck. Why? Because you know you're not going to work forever. You know that. You know that. So what? Prepare earlier and less will happen. Now, I'm going to give you a little pop quiz here. If you don't have a writing instrument, grab one of the golf pencils in the pew and take out your notes. And don't cheat. Don't look at what your neighbor's going to write down. It's a, it's a two-option pop quiz. Would you rather me to give you $10,000 every day for a month, 30 days, Say that's three hundred thousand dollars. Okay, would you rather give have me give you ten grand cash every day for thirty days, or would you rather me give you a penny and double it every day for thirty days? Say, what do you mean double it? Well, the first day it's two cents, second day it's four cents, okay, third day it's eight cents, fourth day sixteen cents. Which one would you rather have? Three hundred grand cash. Or the penny doubled every day for 30 days. Look down, write your answer. Don't look at your neighbor. Write it down. Which one? You can say cash money or penny. One of the two. All right, now I'm going to ask you for your answers. You're like, I'm not standing up on either one. Don't be a chicken. How many of you picked the 300,000 cash? Stand up. Stand up, $300,000 cash. It's a lot of money, right? So like, good deal, good deal. Okay, sit down. Now, let's see how many people picked a penny. Picked a penny. Okay, some people didn't do either one. My question is, wait, wait, wait. My question is, why'd you pick the penny? It's what? According to the math, have you done that before? No, I mean, have you done the math on it? You did right then? Not right then. You've done it before. Anybody else just picked the penny? How many of you would say, I just picked the penny because it sounded weird and I figured that was the answer? 
There was a lot of you. Okay, I, I knew that. Thank you for being honest. Go ahead and sit down. Guess what it is? It's $3 million. You're like, you're kidding me. Yeah, it's $3 million. Doubled. It's the, what it is, it's the magic of compound interest. It's a magic of starting early, and you don't have to put a lot away, but if you start early, and over the years it compounds, it goes to work for you, and the later you start, the less you get to take advantage of the compounding interest. Here's what I teach my Bible class for the last 10 years. Hopefully a few of them learned it. I always told the kids in the class, and listen, if one of you guys understand what I'm doing and what I'm teaching you, and you put it to practice, when you're rich, I want you to buy me a Porsche, but by the time you're rich, I won't be able to get in and out of it. So just buy me a really cool car that I can get in and out of, okay? That was the deal I made with them. They were all like, yeah, we'll do that, you know, when you become multimillionaires, because why? It works for everyone, no matter who it is. What does? The truth. You're like, I, 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 I don't make enough money. I don't make enough money. See, being a multimillionaire is only for people that make really huge salaries. That's not true according to the Bible. I'll show you right now how to be a multimillionaire for the price of a pack of cigarettes every day. How many people downriver can afford a pack of cigarettes every day? Evidently, lots of them. Our salaries aren't huge, but they can buy those smokes. Or maybe you can buy a latte. Or this is, so the, for the price of a pack of cigarettes today, what is it, $7 for a pack of smokes today? For that amount of money, you can be a multimillionaire because of compounding interest. If you started at 18 years of age, and you and your spouse, you say you get married at 18, sure you can. They used to, my, my parents' generation did it all the time. And guess what? They have more than all of us. And they got married when they were kids. But you know what? They didn't get married moving into 3,500 square foot homes. Because they had lived through the Depression. And so they learned to set money aside because they were guaranteed. If you, I mean, you talk to them now. It's been 80 years since the Depression. They're like, oh, it's right around the corner. Because once you live through it, you never forget that kind of a down cycle. Amen. Okay. So here's what you do. Price of a pack of cigarettes during the course of a whole year, it's $2,500. And if you and your spouse do that together, that's $5,000. You're like, $5,000, I'm rich. No, you're not yet. But if you set that money into a mutual fund like we talked about last week, put it, in, put it into the stocks, okay, and forget about it. The average stock over the last 75 years, Dow Jones Industrial Average, has averaged 12% when you return when you reinvest the dividends, it's averaged 12% over the last 75 years. That means some years it's lower, some years it's higher. 12% over the last 75 years. So you put that $5,000 away and let it compound by 12% a year over 70 years when you're 88. Let me tell you what it is. I have it written down in my notes. It becomes, on your 88th year, of life, that $5,000 that you put away 70 years ago becomes $3,948,730 and 50 cents. $4 million. You're like, but you're 88 and you can't do anything with it then. That's what you're thinking, right? Now, here's the scary thing. That's only if you do it one year. Say, so, what do you mean one year? What if you did it every year during those 70 years? What if you put, you and your spouse put away $5,000 every one of those 70 years? Yes, that last year would be $4 million, but you get to add up all the years then. 
And it amounts to over $85 million for the price of a pack of cigarettes a day. And you're like, I don't believe it. Do the math. It's true. So when you're 88 and you're worth 85 cool million, what do you get to do then? I get to go to Disneyland. No, no, no. Way better than that. You know what you've created? You've created this thing known as generational wealth. Amen, brother. And you've also taught the same principle to your kids. And, to your, and they have taught it to your, your grandkids and great-grandkids. So your, your grandkids, your, when they get out of high school, you say, Hey, honey, what do you want to Well, I want to serve God with my life. Great. What do you want to do? I'll pay for it. Right. You want to go be a missionary? Fine. Go be one. Here's the check. Right. Amen. We can be world changers. Right. It's all right in the book. And that's just the price of a pack of a cigarette. What if, you, what if you're a double pack smoker? That's 170 million. That starts sounding interesting, doesn't it? So that whole misnomer, oh, I don't make enough money. Yes, you do. The problem is you spend more than you make. We somehow believe along with our culture, that if I make a dollar, I should spend about a dollar and four cents. Instead of making a dollar and spending 50 cents and leaving margin for the future. Well, I can't do that. Sure you can. Our grandparents did it. You can do it. We just have to learn what to say no to and what to say yes to. The greatest Word to learn for your financial future is a two-letter word, no. Well, I want to buy that. No. Well, I need to do, I need that. No, I don't. I can live without it. I can live without it. And so being a good steward means to start with something other than excuses like, I don't make enough money to do something. Everybody in this room makes enough money to set aside the price of a pack of cigarettes every day. Everybody does. Why don't we do it? Because we're too busy making excuses. It's not a priority. We haven't learned from the ant. And then when the day comes, here's what we say. God, how come so-and-so is successful and I'm not? You, and many times we blame God, you didn't take care of me. Like you took care of others. They got a better deal than I got. They got a better deal than I got. Now think about this. The average person in Taylor... In Taylor, their per capita income is $43,000 a year. You don't have to set aside 40 of it. No, just 2,500. 2,500. But if you do what Joseph said, and you set aside 8,600, 20%, <laughs> you'll get there way quicker. Way quicker. You don't have to wait till you're 88. In fact, at 65, You'll, you'll have so much, you won't know what to do with it. But we haven't been taught these things from God's Word, and yet we're, it's right there. But many times we spend our financial life making excuses. About, because why? Because we never say no. Because we look at others and say, well, I don't want to be without that moment, that this, that that. And I want to fit in with all the other broke people. I want to fit in. Dave Ramsey says it this way. If you want to live like no one else, you have to live like no one else. Right. If you want to get to 65 and not have a sweat and be like, oh, man, life is great, then you can't follow the crowd because they're going to be sweating it at 65. So if you do everything they're doing, expect the same result. But he says, if you want to live differently, if you want to have a different end, then you have to live differently during the process. Here's a great question. Who do you want to be? You want to be that guy that 
has generational wealth and can affect the kingdom and can send out missionaries and can build churches and never run out of money? Amen. How is that possible? Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is a slave to the lender. So the more we live under our means and make room for margin and set that aside in the storehouse, the more options we have in the future. The more options we have in the future. We have to make room for margin. That means living underneath what we could spend by simply saying no. Point number two, say no to co-signing. Say no to co-signing. Say why? Well, number one, we're going to find out in a minute because the Bible says not to. And number two, because this has devastated more relationships, families, loved ones, and friends than any other broken financial truth in Scripture. Somebody comes, it could be a friend, a relative, even your own children. They say, hey, I, I, I need this and, and I can't get it. Would you co-sign? Proverbs 22, 26 and 27 says this, Don't be one of those who enter agreements who put up security for loans. That's a cosigner. If you have no money to pay, even your bed will be taken from under you. Whether it's a friend, a relative, or even if it's your children, the reason they need a cosigner is why? Because the lender knows they can't afford it. They know that. If they thought they could afford it, they'd loan it to them. Right. But they know they can't afford it, so they say, you got to get a cosigner. So we don't trust you to pay. When you cosign, you know what you're doing? You're indebting yourself to that debt. Right. So I've seen this happen in myriad ways. Parents cosigning for their kids to buy their first home. And three years later, their kids divorce. And they walk from the house, and guess who's stuck paying for it? Mom and dad. They will come to you for it. Why? You signed. I've seen that with cars. I've seen it with, with family members that are in business together, and they take a business loan, and then all of a sudden things aren't going well, and the brother or the sister says, I'm out of here. And, and they leave. And you want to make a go of it, guess what? You have to pay the whole amount. Because why? You co-signed. Well, I, I just want to help them. Right? I just want to help them. The next thing. Others, here's how you can help them. Because others need to learn how to earn, save, and make their own way in life. Co-signing isn't helping them. You're crippling them. You're crippling them from knowing the realities that, you know what, sometimes we just can't afford stuff. And we need to realize it. And it's okay. It's okay. I plan on going my whole life and not owning a Bentley. That's okay. It's okay. Amen. All right? I'm never calling hair loss for men. It's too expensive. How do I know that? Somebody's told me. And I'm not buying a laser thing either. They don't work. Okay? And all the things, you know, we look, you look at things and you're like, why are they, uh, man, I don't know, man, I don't, I don't want, I have a friend who has a friend that owns a Bentley in this area. And we were playing golf one day and he said, hey, you know, my friend with a Bentley, I said, well, you know, I, I know him. And he said, well, he, he had a pothole the other day and it bent his rim. I was like, ooh. How much did that cost? $2,500 for a tire rim. Just shoot me. I don't want to have a car like that. Do you? If you digged it, I don't even want to think about it. You walk out and somebody's taking their key. And you're like, it's a $20,000 paint job. Whatever. I'm sure they put several layers on it and all that special. They, they got to do something to charge three, $325,000 for a car. Right. It's just not, let me tell you, it just doesn't make your life great. Right. It doesn't. To me, it looks like a headache on four wheels. Right. And yet we look at it and we're like, oh, 
I wonder who's in there. Somebody that has so much money, they don't worry about it. They park them in streets. Because why? They can afford it. We can't. It's all right. Life goes on. Can I get an amen? It's okay. It's okay. But don't co-sign. Because the best thing you can help your friends, your, your, even your children and relatives is by telling them, now I know I'm not co-signing, but save up until you can afford it. Save up. Save up money, and then you can afford it. I'll say no to co-signing. Number three, here's a yes. Say yes to eliminating bosses in your life. Say eliminate bosses? I only have one employer. I only have one employer. Say, well, if you're married, you have two employers. Okay? You have the one you work for, and then you have the one you're married to. Can I get an amen? And you better make both of those bosses happy. But if you have a mortgage, if you have a car, note, loan, or lease, if you have credit card debt, if you have student loans, if you have a home equity loan, all those are bosses in your life. Try not paying one of them, and you'll find out how much of an authority figure they are. They are. They're bosses. Why do you want to work for 20 different people? It's hard enough to work for one. Can I get an amen? amen. So eliminate the bosses. Eliminate the bosses. How do, we, how do you do that? Well, Dave Ramsey says this. Dave Ramsey says that you need to get a gazelle mentality. And who's the gazelle? The, ge- the gazelle is that deer-like creature that lives out on the plains along with Mr. and Mrs. Lion. And the lion, Mr. and Mrs., loves eating Mr. and Mrs. Gazelle. The gazelles are lunchboxes on hooves for the lions. And you've seen this on TV. They're out there in the plains, and there's all these grass, and there's a whole herd of them. And they're, they're eating, but their ears are go, they're, 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 they're like nervous. All the, they're like the squirrels in your backyard. They're really nervous all the time. Nervous, nervous, nervous. And as soon as they hear something, the whole herd, they go, all at once. They look, and they... And they all say, oh, it's nothing. Oh, no. They look, and then they bolt. <laughs> like that. And we, I'm like, why are they running? And then all of a sudden, out of the grass comes Mr. or Mrs. Lion. They heard something. They heard a twig. They heard this. And guess what? They want to start running as fast and as far as they can, as soon as they can, because they know if that line gets you, your lunch. Right. We need to view debt owing like Mr. and Mrs. Lion. It will eat your lunch. It will ruin your life right. if you don't run from it with the intensity, eyes bugging out of your head, run for your life. Amen. This isn't a Bambi thing. No, they're like, <laughs> dust storm. Why? If he gets them, it's over. And what do we do? At 18, we start getting love letters in the mail from all the credit card companies. <laughs> Did you notice that? They're like, they, lo- they know me. Hey, Mr. Downs, you're 18. Congratulations. Get Visa, MasterCard, Discover, American Express. We love you. Here. How about you go to a store? Can I just buy this? No, I have to say no to 14 things before I buy it. Would you like to open an account today? Well, what kind of account? A credit account. I'll save you 15% today. Why? Because every one of those merchandisers know they will make more money off of you paying interest on debt to them than they will the product that they're selling you. They know. They're lions hiding in the grasses, wanting to steal your freedom and to take away all your choices, especially when you're older. 
So don't limit what God can do. What do you mean don't limit? Live with a mindset of gazelle intensity and run from indebtedness. Run from, and if, if something is really attractive and it's like, oh, it, and it really has your number, what should you do? Run from it. Don't hang around it like Adam and Eve in the tree because you'll be eating it. Well, I'm not going to buy it. I'm just going to look at it on the Internet every day. <laughs> I'm just going to go do this. I'm just, man, if you put pictures of it everywhere, it's going to happen. Okay? That lion's going to sink his teeth in you, and a week after you have it, you're going to say, oh, I shouldn't have done it. It's too bad. It's too late. It owns you. Now, you're sitting here saying, well, i got to get things to live. I, I understand. But I want you to know that the wealthy spend less for the very same things that we buy because they pay for them all at once. Right. What do you mean? They save all that interest. They're buying the same product, but they're buying it cheaper. Because why? They've learned to put it off until they can pay cash for it. And then it saves all that interest. It saves all the hassle. Because why? You can really afford it. So they, they pay for the same thing. See, if you have an emergency fund in your bank account, you don't have to, when you buy car insurance, you don't have to buy, well, I better get the zero deductible because, man, I, I got no money, and if I got in an accident, how could I come up with... But see, if you have an emergency fund in the bank, you can get a $1,000 deductible. And your insurance rates will go way down because it's cheaper. The higher deductible, the less the payment. Okay? And you're like, well, I don't want to pay that. Well, if you have it, you will save. How many accidents are you? What kind of a driver are you? Amen, most of us are great drivers. Notice I said most. No identifying yourself tonight, but most of us are great drivers, and typically, the only accident you, you get in when somebody hits you, and it's a very rare occurrence in life. So why spend 40 years giving them way more money than they deserve because we don't have an emergency fund in case that accident does happen and we couldn't afford a $1,000 deductible? It makes no sense. So what do the wealthy do? The wealthy put as high a deductible as they can on their insurance, and they save money every month compared to us. They get the same product, less money. Less money. That's what the wealthy do. Think about it. When the credit crisis hit in 2008 and 2009, tell me how much house you could have got around this town for $100,000. Any house you wanted for $100,000, but you had to have cash because no one was getting loans. But if you have cash money, take your pick. Did those houses sell? Yes. To who? People that had cash. People that had saved and prepared. And they bought the same house for $100,000 that all their neighbors paid three fifty dollars for. The wealthy buy the same things and pay less for them. Learn that. Learn that. How about when, when, boom, when, when boom times happen, the price of everything gets more expensive? And if you say no during the boom times, during the bus times, when people are unloading their motorcycles, their fancy cars, and their, their, their jet skis, and all their fun stuff because, man, I didn't see this coming, and, man, we got to get rid of this stuff. You can pay pennies on the dollar for the same stuff that they paid out the nose for during the boom times. You just need to have cash and patience. And you can pick up one of those fun things during a bus time because you have set aside. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? Getting the same thing you wanted only a couple years later for 20 cents on the dollar. Sign me up. It's a great deal. It happens all the time in life. There's cycles. There's cycles. And I didn't mean by cycles, motorcycles. Okay, if that's your thing, believe me. 
I just listened to a man in church tell me about doing the exact same thing this winter. Look at point number four. I got to close. Say yes to building barns. I'm not a farmer. Ah, barns. I'm not talking about putting a big pole barn in your yard and your neighbor's hating on you. I'm talking about vehicles for putting the grain into. The excess grain, the margin grain that you've decided to set aside. You have to put it into barns. You have to put it into storage facilities where it will be taken care of. This could be savings account, money market accounts, certificates of deposit, stock certificates, uh, bond certificates, anything. Those are what? Those are barns that you set that excess money into and, it, and you put it to work for you. Up until recent time, savers were rewarded in the United States of America. Savers are being stolen from by the federal government right now because they don't want you saving money. And so they've forcibly put the interest rates down low by printing excess money. And all it's doing is taking your grandma and grandpa's money. That's all they're doing. They're taking it and redistributing that money to people that don't want to work and spend it on the government programs. But if they would release and real interest rates would happen. Typically, a mortgage interest rate in a healthy environment is 7 to 10% interest. And in your savings, you would reap 5 to 7% interest just for saving it. Just for saving it. When I was a young man at college, I sold my business before I went to college. I put all that money into CDs, certificates of deposit at the bank. And I earned 10 to 15% at the bank on certificates of deposit. You're like, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. It was in the early 80s. You can check, you can go back and check the interest rates. You're like, that's insane. It was during one of those cycles where inflation was high and savers were rewarded. Okay? The environment that we're in right now is a false environment because of the government printing so much money. I don't want to get in explain that too much, but you can put it into other vehicles, okay, great corporations that make a lot of money and will pay you a dividend that's way higher than the bank or the CD will pay you, okay, and depending on your time frame, put it into some barns, don't just put it under your mattress, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest, then... Your barns, plural, will be completely filled, and your vats, plural, will overflow with new wine. Don't put it all in one thing. Distribute it, and it's called diversify it. Because why? Because they do this. They go up and down. And so sometimes in the interest rate environment right now is really low, and so Corporate earnings are really what you want. And then other times, corporate earnings and interest rate environments are going to be better. It, it, so divide it into many barns. Don't just, the, the saying is, don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's true. This grain that you set aside for the future, don't just put it all in, like, for instance, your company stock. Don't do that. Put it into various barns. Diversify it. So it's spread across many things. Okay? Now, Think about Joseph. I want you to really listen to this. The stored grain for the lean years was as important or maybe more important as the current grain. The grain during the seven years, did they need it? Yes. Did they enjoy it? Yes. But how much more important was the stored grain that they set aside during the seven years of famine? Because think about what happened to Egypt. During those seven years of famine, Egypt became wealthy as a nation because all the other nations came to them and gave them their stuff, gave them all their gold, their silver, their land, their animals, so that they could just survive. Egypt got wealthy during a bus cycle because they took advantage of it. They took advantage of it. And we, too, as Christians... When everybody else is moaning, oh, it's horrible, and this or that. If you have set aside during the good years, you can take advantage during the bad years 
and get extreme, I mean, jump ahead of the pack exponentially during those years. That's what Egypt did. That's what Egypt did. Now, why did God do that with Egypt? He was taking all that wealth down to Egypt so the Jews could walk out with it when he set them free 400 years later. Amen. They exited with all that wealth. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? He was funneling it to his kids. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, so what we have to do is just look beyond the day. And like we learned in the first lesson, we need to ask God to help you fill your barns. Ask God to help you fill it. Ask God to give you the strength and the will to say no to the right things, to say yes to the right things so that you can fill those barns Amen. for the future. Proverbs 3, 13 through 18 says, Happy is the man who finds wisdom and who acquires understanding. For she, wisdom, is more profitable than silver and her revenue is better than gold. Having the understanding about how it works is more important than the gold and silver because we always think, oh no, it's a, some people have the gold and some people don't. No, it's, it's all about the wisdom. If you have the wisdom and understanding, the gold's yours. The silver's yours. It's all about the wisdom. Amen. She, wisdom, is more precious than jewels. Nothing you desire compares with her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left, riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant, and all her paths peaceful. She, wisdom, is a tree of life to those who embrace her and those who hold on to her, cling to her, are happy. So it very clearly, church, encourages us to pray for wisdom, and then, as we take advantage of wisdom, we will receive wealth, honor, and long life. That sounds like a great deal, doesn't it? Wow. Well, it's only for certain people. That's not what it says. Right. It's for anyone. Anyone that puts it into practice. Now, what we need to do, though, in conclusion, is discard our excuses and begin preparing today. Discard the excuses. And what excuses? The thing that keeps you from doing it today. Right. Oh, I... I Maybe one day, now that maybe one day turns into stress, start today. Eliminate that. Eliminate that. Let God bless you by simply your yes being yes and your no being no. Amen? Let's bow our heads. And if you're sitting here tonight, say, Lord, I, I, I want your wisdom. I, I want to cling to it. I, I want to start applying it to my life. Help me to see which things I should say yes to and no to. And Lord, once you give me that, the, the, tr the entrapment that I'm, always in, I, I'm already in, may I run out of them like a gazelle running from the lion. And as you do that, one at a time, Lord, give me confidence to keep doing it more and more so I can be free from the entrapment of this world's thinking. If that's your prayer tonight, just lift your hands up and say, that's my prayer. Father God, Lord, set us free from this world's thinking so we can enjoy the abundant life that you have prepared for those that apply all of your principles to our life. In Jesus' name we pray. If you pray with me, church, say amen. amen. All right, let's sing about Christ being enough for us.